We are in the book of Ephesians this morning, and so open your Bibles there. And remember, this is the last week of what we've uh, called our Missions Month. We have a theme this month. It's called Transformed. And we have been exploring the way that God transforms our lives when we come to know Jesus. We have also been uh, engaging and thinking about how God changes people around the world as the gospel of Jesus is shared around the world. Every tribe, every tongue, every culture, Jesus is concerned about all of them. And so he is engaging and sending missionaries around the world, sending his word around the world in order that people would come to know Jesus and be transformed and saved. I argued in week one that one of the first things that happens with us is that God makes us new, literally a new creation, and he gives us a new relationship with him. Week two, we talked about one of the things that happens is we're individuals that live by faith now. Once we lived by sight, we lived by just everything that was in front of us, and God is now making a transformation inside of us so that we live by faith. Peter was up last week and he said one of the changes that happens with us is that, that God changes our view of people. And he used the example of Peter going to Cornelius in the Bible. And God had to do as much work inside of Peter as he did inside of Cornelius to make all of that occur. And so God is transforming us in our view of people. This week we have one more transformation or one more aspect of transformation that we're going to explore And I I need to start off with a little something somber. Life sometimes leaves us feeling powerless. Let me give you a few examples. I just spoke with a friend recently who discovered that he has fourth stage prostate cancer. It didn't sneak up on him. He was aware that he had a rising PSA that was kind of happening before covid and then COVID happened. It was difficult to get into the doctor. He ended that time and you know, got ready to get back in to see his doctor and found out his doctor had retired. So he needed to find a, na- a new primary care physician. That all took some time. The test took some time. By the time they, they got back in and discovered it, fourth stage prostate cancer and it had spread throughout his body. My friend, I know, is feeling rather powerless right now you think about denise and i have seen week after week every night on the news somewhere in the midwest is a tornado or flooding and people give all the same story they say the storm was on its way we headed to the cellar we heard what sounded like a train passing by and it's the epicenter of a tornado as it's passing through we came up out of our cellar only to find houses just disheveled debris everywhere and we felt powerless in the teeth of this great storm you think about the individuals right now that are in israel and have loved ones that are still being held in gaza the count is now 233 days with no real hope that those individuals are going to be released i'm saying those individuals are feeling rather powerless today it's a common human experience to feel powerless against forces that are bigger than us it's it's very common to feel rather small and one of the biggest transformations that god places into our lives is that he connects us to power to the greatest power source ever known by man we are connected to power as a result of what God is doing in our lives. When God transforms, He provides power. I'm reading today from Ephesians chapter 1, starting in verse 18, and I have that up here on the screen for us. Follow along as I read. This is what Paul writes to the the Ephesians. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened, in order that you may know the hope to which He's called you, the riches of His glorious inheritance in His holy people, and his incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is the same as the mighty strength he exerted when he raised Christ from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, 
and every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. Father, rest upon us right now and make this passage real in our lives. We want the eyes of our hearts to be enlightened. Do that right now through the power of your spirit. We pray this in the name of Jesus. Amen. I have a picture here of Lake Tahoe. Some of you have been there. Denise and I actually honeymooned in Lake Tahoe 36 years ago. And it was a great time. In fact, we might have been there right now. Our anniversary is on the 21st. And so uh, we spent a little bit of time and we would have been there 36 years ago. What I didn't know at the time that I was on that beautiful lake is that that is the eighth deepest lake in the entire world. It's, it's huge and it's deep. In fact, it's 1,645 feet deep and that was first discovered on July the 4th, uh, Independence Day, 1875. Some guys rowed a boat out into the middle of the lake and they used a weighted champagne bottle on fishing line and they dropped it all the way down and measured correctly uh, 1,645 16, feet deep. That was confirmed years later when there was sonar available. Scientists got the contour of the lake and determined, yeah, they were correct. Let me give you an example of just how deep this lake is. If you were to take Lake Tahoe and tip it onto its side, it would fill all of California with 14 and a half inches of water. I know that still is just like, wow, that's a big number. I have no idea how big that is. Well, guess what? If you were to give everybody in the United States 50 gallons of water per day, you would give everybody water in the United States for five years out of Lake Tahoe. Here's the point. Like the water in Lake Tahoe, God provides his people with a resource so vast, so immense, it's difficult to even quantify. Notice again that Paul's saying here, I want the eyes of your heart to be enlightened. In the ancient world, the heart was the center of the person, the inner being, the essence of who you are. And he's saying, I want the eyes of your heart. He's using this image of, uh, of something that allows an image or a light into the heart. And he want, I want your hearts to be enlightened by a couple things. And he argues again, well, number one, it's the hope of your salvation or the hope of your calling. But number two, he says, I want your hearts to be enlightened by the incomparably great power available to those of us who believe. And I've got that on the screen here for you right now, that just phrase that he uses, because I want that to sink so, sink so deeply into you. The incomparably great power. I want your hearts to be enlightened with that. And that's what we want to talk about today. What is that power that he's talking about? What's that power How does God want us to put that into use or into practice? What are his purposes he's using in our lives right now that he wants that power source to be connected to? That's what we're going to explore. First, the power available to us is expansive. It's a power immense. It's greater than we could ever imagine. And he uses a word here. He uses the word power, but then he tacks on several adjectives in order to explain that even more. There's the verse I'm referring to, verse 19. And there you see, again, he has the word power. But as if that's not enough, he's saying it's the same as the mighty strength. And so he's using more adjectives to explain what that power is like. Now, I don't want to take us down into the weeds today too far into the meaning of words and word studies. But I do want to just give a glance off that just for a minute because there's some interesting things he's doing and talking about power in this way. First of all, power is the word dunamis in the Greek. And it's where we get our word dynamite from. And dunamis means something that has inherent power. It's something that has just intrinsic power. It's just got power at the ready. And dynamite is a good example of that because dynamite in its very nature has power. It only needs the spark and all all of a sudden, whammo, you've got a big explosion and all that energy is released from it. 
He's saying that's like the power of God. It's just inherent in its very nature. The very nature of God is power. But he doesn't stop there. He says, I want to use some other words to help you get this. So he uses the word working. The word working is energia. And he says uh, energia is power in action. It's a superhuman power. Do you remember the uh, the, the ever ready bunny and the ever ready bunny goes around bang, bang 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 and he goes around forever just you know banging the drum on the energy from his uh, little cell and he's saying you know this is the kind of energy and action of God and the way that he operates uh, so he's saying he, he's got a never ending supply of this power he also uses the word mighty it's the strength that somebody has from over a realm it's the, the power exerted over space. You think about a grizzly bear. And a grizzly bear is, you know, the top of the food chain. He's the predator at the apex of, his, of the forest. And he can eat almost anything. He can eat berries and nuts, but he can also eat every animal that's under him. Elk and deer and bison. And he, he can do all that. And his range is immense. I mean, he covers, you know, dozens of square miles in which he is the king of that land. And so that's a good idea of what it means, again, to be having might, because might is over a realm. And so, again, Paul's saying here, and he's not talking grizzly bears, Paul's talking God, and he's saying God is the one, Jesus is the one, who has strength or power over an entire realm, all of his realm, and he's saying that's the kind of power that he has. Now, again, Paul's using a bunch of words here to describe power And I think Paul's even struggling to come up with enough words to explain the power that God has. And he's saying something to all of us. I want the eyes of your heart to be enlightened for you to understand God and his power that's now somehow being made available to you. So he gives all of those metaphors, all of those uh, explanations here to just talk to us about how great the power is available to us from God. Well, he doesn't stop there. Second, he says the power is demonstrated. By this, I mean that the power has been used in the past and is indicative of the power available to us today. He uses three instances in Christ's life to say this is the way the power of God has been demonstrated in the past and it's indicative of the power in the future. These are the three instances that he refers to. The raising of Christ from the dead the seating of Christ at the right hand of God, and the complete ruling and authority of Christ now and forevermore. So that's the order of what he's saying here about the power of God that's been displayed in the past. I wonder what what power you've seen in the past that's the greatest power you've ever seen. I think about the movie Oppenheimer. And Oppenheimer, uh, you know, they do a great job of showing the first nuclear tests that are in the Nevada desert and the people put on the glasses and some even like put uh, like a sunscreen on to keep their faces from the radiation heat that's going to come they really have no idea what's going to happen or what it's going to look like but the mushroom cloud goes off and they're just kind of in awe and all of a sudden they feel the the shock wave that just passes over them even though they're miles away and the movie does a great job of of just saying you know they were experiencing something they only imagined could occur and it was bigger than any power that they had ever experienced. I wasn't there for that, neither were you, but I was there in my life in California when there was a 5.9 earthquake nearby. I was in a car at the time and I can tell you the car literally jolted off the road. I mean, it was like it was just steering sideways and I saw something with my eyes I've never seen happen before in land it was like a wave rolled across the land. It was like watching jello. And, and it's like, am I seeing that? Am I seeing the ground literally moving in that way? And it's the greatest, you know, again, power source that I've ever seen. Well, God is saying, I'm not referring to anything natural like that that you've seen before. I'm, the, uh, I'm appealing to you that the power I have is the power that literally raised Jesus from the dead and that is an amazing power to be able to take something that's completely dead and breathe life back to back into it I read this week Dr. Thomas Miller he's a surgeon a cardiologist uh, he's a researcher 
And he explores the miracle of Christ being raised from the dead. And he argues like this. He says that the body has literally a trillion cells in it. And all of these are choreographed together with a chemical process that allows them all to talk and do their function. And he's saying in order for Christ to be resurrected from the dead, something has to spark all of those processes, all of those cells, all of that communication back into, again, proper function. And it has to be done in just the right sequence. This is what he says. A bodily resurrection implies that thousands of processes in trillions of cells must be restarted with the unique intricacy and interconnectedness that existed before death. Dr. Miller notes that, the war, the, that this would require not just incredible power, but also unimaginable knowledge. He says, even the latest science has not unraveled the complete mystery of each of the cells of our bodies and how they interact and talk with one another. But for the resurrection of Jesus to occur, all of that information had to be known in its completeness and totality, and it had to be known 2,000 years ago. That is the nature of the power of God that we're dealing with. That is the nature of what God says is available to us through Christ, is the power that literally raised Jesus from the dead is the power that he's giving somehow to us. Furthermore, he exerts the power in Jesus today, having authority over everything, every dominion, every force, every spiritual being. Jesus has supremacy over all of that. Whether it is natural or spiritual, Jesus has authority there. Now, again, throughout history and still today, there are many people in the world that are afraid again of evil powers or afraid of supernatural powers that they can't see. And Paul is saying something about that. He's saying Jesus has authority over all of those. He's greater than all of those. He rules over all of those. All of those ultimately are, are under, his, under his control. And I heard an interesting story just this weekend, I think that really exemplifies this. There was a couple that went on a cruise and uh, they were on a cruise, and you know, on a cruise ship, you normally, if you've ever been that, on that before, you know that if you go to the dining room, you're developing somewhat of a relationship with your servers. They're usually the same ones that are serving you, you know, kind of day after day, and you're getting to know them. And it's typical, and many times in cruises, those individuals are sometimes from other countries. And their English is impeccable, their service is fantastic, but they're the ones that are coming to serving you and getting to know you. Well, my friend is somewhat of an evangelist and he just said, I felt the nudge on that last day we were on the cruise to reach out to the girl who was from Sumatra. And I said to her, do you know Jesus? And the wife said she took a gasp. It's like, oh boy, here we go. You know, I, I can't believe he's asking that question right now. And the girl said, it's funny you say that. I have been having a repeated dream in which these evil and powerful people are chasing me. And there's this man that steps in, that's clothed in white, and he ushers me off to safety. And my friend said to her, that's Jesus. And he said, if you ever have that dream again, ask the man who he is. I'm quite confident it will, he will say that I'm Jesus. And she was so elated that he had brought that up and wanted to talk more. But she's an example of individuals around the world today that are having spiritual forces in their lives that are tormenting them and hunting them and controlling them. And Paul says, Jesus above all rule, all authority, power and dominion, above every name that is invoked, not only in the present age, but in the one to come. And he's saying this Jesus who has demonstrated this kind of power or God has demonstrated this power in him is the one who's continuing on and giving us power today. Third, the power is available by faith. That's what Paul says. I want to enlighten your hearts. I want you to understand this. I want you to tap into this. And I need for you to know this is not like some New Age mantra. New Age mantra, find the power within. No, no, no. You never have that kind of power resident within yourself. 
It's the power resident within God, but that's somehow made available to you. And so don't go thinking you're all that in a bag of chips. You're not. You're still human you. And so again, what God is saying here is again something very big. It's a power that's never been inside you or the power that is yours, but somehow that power is on loan from somebody that really has it and is being offered to you. And that's something that he tells the Ephesians that they are to understand so that they can live lives that honor God. He also says in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, same book, same letter that he's writing to the Ephesians, but he says, Now to him who's able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according, there it is, to his power that is at work within us. So he's saying to us, God is working with power in our lives to do things beyond all that we would even imagine, all that we would ever dream of. He's doing some work right now and he's working in the circumstances of our lives to bring his power to bear. I ran across an article this week by, uh, in Christianity Today and some of you may know that the Congo, the Democratic Republic of the Congo is one of the most dangerous spots on earth today. There's been a 20-year civil war going on there, constant infighting, dozens of individuals killed uh, you know, weekly there as a result of all this fighting. And I want to introduce to you somebody who is in the midst of all of that, and he's actually been held as a political prisoner right now. His name is Lazare Rukundwa. Here he is. Here is Razare, our brother in Christ. Lazare, our brother in Christ. And this is what he writes in the article. By the way, the article is titled this. The article is titled, I'm a political prisoner in Congo. My ministry is thriving. Here's what he writes. He says, I was arrested during the time I was falsely accused of calling people in the East to arms. But I was on video, and my lawyers have submitted this, pronouncing the Nairobi process calling for a ceasefire In fact, I was part of the process and I've long been dedicated to peace and development. After being shifted from prison to prison and finally to Makala, I joined the Assemblies of God Chaplaincy and a team of ordained prisoners who minister with the help of donations and resources that we're able to receive from the outside. Early on, I asked the committee about starting a literacy class in the prison due to the huge number of people who don't know how to read or write. The initiative caught the attention of authorities, many of whom had a humane spirit. And so about 100 people, men and women, boys and girls, are now benefiting from the program. And over 50 have now learned how to read, write, and calculate. One adult student said, I never expected that I would learn how to read and write in prison. Thank you for this. When somebody in jail learns how to hold a pencil and reaches a stage of reading, writing, and calculating... I feel like making a song to the Lord, the master of times and circumstances. Another adult said, now I need a Bible to read now that I can read for myself. Besides the literacy classes in April, we also initiated a skills training class on making soap, detergent, and disinfectant for 54 students. The teacher is also a detainee. We're able to use these products to help improve our own sanitary conditions. He says, being a prisoner does not make me less human. I continue to dream, to be creative, and to be a person who can turn circumstances into opportunities. I submit to you that our brother in Christ, Lazare, understands the power of God. Even though he is a prisoner in a human jail, wrongly even kept, He is an individual who understands the power of God. Paul says, let the eyes of your heart be enlightened. Know the power of God that is available to you. Let me close with this story today. In the United States, when power first started spreading across the country, it, of course, started in cities like most technology does, But then it spread out to different parts that were rural areas. And there was one rural area where power electricity finally came and a lady lady paid a great amount of money for the power company to lay some of the cables and lines out to her house. The electricity came to her house and the power company, you know, started looking across the grid and finding out, 
you know, where power is being used. And they noticed that although energy and although electricity was out to this house, just a small fraction of power was being used there. And they thought, we must have some problems with, you know, our equipment. So they sent out a meter reader, an electrician, to go out and inspect things. And he asked the lady, he said, our, you know, how, how's the electricity going? She said, oh, well, you know, we're using it just fine. He says, well, what are you using it for? And she said, well, we turn on the electricity every night and we have a light that we use in the evening and then we turn the electricity off. And we and I think about that and it's like we take electricity so for granted today. We think of all the ways in our house that we're powering things and for somebody to use it to turn on one little light and then turn it off and then go, you know, shut the breaker down. It's like, what are you doing? We are much more like the lady than we ever want to admit because we have the greatest power source available to us of all times, God himself. And here we are, we're going to come to church today and some of us for the rest of the week are just going to go on autopilot and not think much about him. We're going to go through problems in our lives, big problems, and we won't turn to God until, well, it really gets desperate. In fact, that, that's not our first reaction. It's our second, third, or fourth reaction. We're individuals who operate a lot out of our own strength rather than operating out of the strength which God gives us, which is this immense power, enough to even raise Jesus from the dead. What is our problem with all of this? Well, I think it's twofold. First of all, we don't have a proper understanding of that power. I'm hoping that today's passage in Ephesians says, this is part of your transformation. The power that's available to you is incredible. Explore it, understand it. Secondly, I think we're individuals who don't realize just how weak we are without that power. God's power and his ability are at our disposal waiting for us to tap into it. God's power can be the source of our great strength, our great encouragement, our great happiness if we would only use how to ask for it and how to use it. And of course, that assumes that we indeed know Christ. You can't have that power unless you know the source, unless you know Jesus personally. And that's the gospel message, is that not that we're great, not that we have power, but that God has power. And we have been a rub, rub, in rebellion against him. We have wanted to go our own way. We've wanted to be our own gods. And it's created all kinds of tension and problems in our lives, too big to even imagine. But God didn't turn his back on us. In love, he made a way for us to be reconciled to him in Christ. And Christ came in order that he might forgive our sins, but indeed give us new life and usher us into the transformation that we've been talking about all month. And this is what it takes. It takes us recognizing the need for that, recognizing what Jesus has to offer and say, yes to him yes with a full heart that says that is a great trade i'm willing to give my old self in order to get the new self that you're offering i'm giving you all of my sin and gaining forgiveness i'm giving you what was decaying and dead and gaining life i'm giving you darkness i'm getting light all of those things are part of the transformation that god brings to us and so here's my key question for you today abundant beyond measure power is available will you use it let's pray lord i pray first of all for any individual with us today that up until today maybe would say you know what i have not placed my faith in jesus maybe today is that day Talking about the power and the forgiveness available in you, it just sparks something on the inside. Holy Spirit, come to that individual right now and call them forth unto yourself. Call them to confess with their mouth and their heart that you are Lord in order that there might be a salvation inside that life that is lasting, permanent, and rejoicing in heaven. For the rest of us, Lord, we have a time today in which we're Come face to face with just how powerful you are and really how weak we are. We need that power. There are instances in our lives that are constantly wanting to swamp us, to shipwreck us, 
and you say, oh, just come to me, ask. You have not because you ask not, Jesus says. And so we come today, we want to avail ourselves of the power that you so freely give. We thank you for that. We thank you that you've told us about that in your Bible. We want to live like that. And so encourage us, strengthen us, give us all kinds of boldness today to come to you and say, Lord, there's an instance in my life where I need your power. Would you put it to work? Be glorified in this, Lord, for your people to have that kind of disposition before you. We pray this in the powerful, the mighty, the strong name of Jesus. Amen.